And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of Voyages of the Vagabond, and the, ma the man behind the deep, deep dungeon games. The one and only Hobie Hill. Please please know King of the Hill jokes. I'm pretty sure he's heard them all. How are you doing tonight, man? Uh, I can't complain. Uh, just sitting here enjoying the, the lovely uh, atmosphere of central part of Texas and mm -hmm. uh, enjoying uh, getting this conversation on. Mm -hmm. So I like to open with the humble beginnings, as as it were, before before we get into the meat of the, of the situation. So... Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Oh, wow. Which I think uh, the majority of creators and content creators out there could probably go on links with this. Um, but role-playing games have been a thing for me since forever, I think. Um, ever since reading books, um, starting with like Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter... Um, R.A. Salvatore, uh, authors like R.R. Uh, mm -hmm. Martin. Um, I mean, gosh, uh, I could go on Brian Jakes and so on and so forth. And mm -hmm. I, I felt like I was playing a game or I was building a story in my mind. And I was not – and reading these characters and, and stuff like that, I felt like I was reading their story, but I also visualized it in my brain. So as a, as a, as a storyteller or a creator – that's where I think I got my very first start, you know, and uh, I, I'm not sure about you, but if you remember the old school game of Diablo or Diablo 2. Yeah, I, spend... still, I still have my copy of both. And unfortunately, right. Hellfire, which ev which everybody at Blizzard wish wishes I didn't have. Yeah, same. I still have the original. Um, you remember the, the guidebooks they sent with you um, with the PC game you bought, right? Mm hmm. And so it was this uh, very thick volume thing. And the majority of the content was what you would consider appropriate for, say, like just installing the game and, and, and things of that nature, right? The general of how to use the software. Yeah. But there was this thread of um, content in there that was like, here's this backstory of these characters and the people that you are playing. And like I fell in love with this stuff so much that like the typical like eighties nineties kid like I would take the pictures out of the of the book and like put them on my wall mm -hmm. right because like I was so enthralled with the story and the the lineage and the story behind these different individuals that I got to play as that I was just like oh my god this is fantastic yeah and I and. Oh, I'm I'm not too far off because I I had a habit of um t of of take of taking off the covers of various ma various books and various magazines and I'd put I'd put them up as mini posters made a whole collage out of the whole thing. Right, the whole wall with like this plethora of like just terrible, you know, uh, rippings out of magazines and books between mm. like skateboarding and and games and like music like uh, it was just this plethora of all the things that I loved. But one thing that kept coming back to me was gaming, tabletop, and just enjoying uh, company. And that's where I think like my beginnings of, of tabletop and RPGs really began was through the games and through like my father, who honestly never played you know any of the stuff until one day he he got the original concept for mm -hmm. Diablo and Diablo Two. Yeah, and. Of course, obviously, but obviously, between those two, even even after all this time, nothing stop nothing stopping Diablo two. And um, I have you speaking of that. Have you ever heard of of uh, Median XL? I, I can't say off the top of my head. I have not. I've not it heard that. It is a very extensive mod for Diablo two. And when it, the other thing that comes to comes to mind with mods is somebody deciding to. to Somebody deciding to run Doom in Diablo 2's engine. <laughs> oh yeah, because like I remember 
back in the day, like being able to, you know, mod the game and like create characters at the top level and the peak performance and all that stuff just to just bash each other on online platforms, like the earliest forms of like, uh, you know, me against you and see what happens. Yeah. And but yeah, so. Oh, go ahead. My, the earliest point of my dice rolling began, uh, I think I was, um, gosh darn, I think I was eight or, or probably younger, you know, seven, seven, eight years old ish. And my mother had basically uh, told my sister that if you want to go out with this, this, this guy, that you have to bring your little brother with you. And I was the little brother that was like, oh, okay, let's go. And um, in that, that moment, they were playing, uh, I want to say it was like uh, second edition or maybe three point or third edition uh, mm -hmm. D&D. And they were like, okay, yeah, you can play, make a character. And I made my very first character, you know, which is a wizard named Gohan after, after you know, one of my favorite animes, you know, Dragon Ball Z. And that was my very first, you know, birth into D&D or tabletop games. Mm -hmm. Now, that, br that brings me to the whole thing with Voyages of the Vagabond. Now, before, before we um, really, delve in, really delve into things... Um, would you mind would you mind terribly giving the skinny on what Voyage of the Vagabond is for the benefit of the temple? Okay, so I mean to give it dry and uh, just as simple as I can bring it. Mm -hmm. um, Voyages of the Vagabond was originally supposed to be titled Voyages of the Vagabond, um, which was a book that I wanted to encompass um, travel and like. Um, terrain and transportation in your fantasy worlds, right? It just happened to be so vast that it ended up being split into two different books um, per, per the project and things like that nature. Because like after a certain point, you get to a, a cost in printing that it gets so expensive to print one book. And it's like, who wants to pay this much money for a book when I can split it in two and they can, I can, I can bring much more content in those two books and also bring the cost down, um, which is always my goal personally is to provide content, but also like give it a value where, where it's accessible, acceptable for you on your on for your games. Mm -hmm. And given that, given that, would it be fair to say that you're designing this with a system agnostic attitude? Yeah. So, um, my goal, what I want is the majority of my content to be system agnostic. So um, some of my early creations and stuff, um, my, my first book that I ever wrote was called A Deception, which was kind of a joke upon Inception, the movie. And, um, and I involve like dice because it is a basically involving dice and games within your games. So it's like the whole th like dreams within your dreams, right? Mm -hmm. And that was my very first book. And I, I didn't realize that this at the time that I was going down this path of like creating content um, for your games for like more than just this concept of like, Oh, fifth edition Pathfinder or, or any other type of concept. Right. Mm -hmm. But what it ended up being was this opening concept of going why is this so much content out there for a specific type of game? Like I, I can't sit there and, and question that anyone's intelligence is, is, is any greater than mine or, 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 or lower than mine or anything like that. Right. So I can't sit there and say that I can't create content that is, gives you as a dungeon master, game master, role builder, storyteller, or whatever you want to say that you can't develop just a few more little bit of stat points or your game based off simple uh, or uh, finely detailed content, right? Mm -hmm. And so on On that point, I was like, when I was playing a game, I, uh, I was given, one of my players asked me, like, I gave a simple, like, explanation of, like, a market, right? And I was like, oh, there are carts filled full of vegetables and fruits and grains, and they were like, well, what kind? And I sat there and I kind of like stared at them like, what, what do you mean? Like, it's just vegetables and fruits. They were like, yeah, I mean, that's cool. But like, what are they called? 
And I was like, shit. Apples? You know, and I was like, I was almost upset at myself that I had to say apples because I'm like, okay, this is a fantasy world. This is a world that doesn't exist. This is a world in my own mental state. This is my own, my own world that I've written on paper. And I had to give my players apples. And I was upset about that. And that's when my first real hardcore book came into fruition. Mm -hmm. Now... When it now, when it comes to now, you mentioned having to you mentioned having to split the Voyages project into into two books. Um, now, first off, when did when talk to me about when it dawned on you that there is no way you could have done this in just in just one book, and how much are we talking about as far as a page count for the two books that it's going to be split into? when I was creating and writing and my fellow creators and writers were also doing the same. And we realized that the page count was going to be this X amount, right? Mm -hmm. um, 500 plus pages, which the most recent book is going to be about that amount. Well, when you go into and you start emailing these, these printers and these companies that, that handle the production of your content, you realize that they're going to charge you this much per whatever it's going to be. Basically, you can almost account it to say a cost per page um, that I like to do because I'm a simple I'm a simple person. And I like to think on simple terms. Um, and while you, I don't think you can say that yes, every page is the same content or it's the same value of content. It's the idea that like you have to put a cost per page because that's just simplistic and believable and. Mm -hmm. It's a foundation that I think we can all respect as you know, creators and stuff like that, right? Oh yeah. And now, when it comes to the when it comes to the two books that it's getting split into in question, tell tell me about each and what um and what the first and second book are going to focus on. So the the voice of the vagabond is what I'm considering a duo of books, right? So in mm -hmm. all of my series, I have I have planned content out to God knows how long, how far out. Um, just depends on the writing, the availability, and, and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, but what it comes down to is going, okay, I want to create – I feel like there's this many categories per uh, a, a type or chapter or sub book, right? So like my, um, my environmental series, right? It covers plants, animals, and um, uh, minerals, right? So like it covers like the flora, the fauna – and everything that it, it comes from that, right? And then also covers the fourth book in the series, which which was a, one of the, the books that I got to develop without a, a Kickstarter or out a project, was just surviving uh, or dealing with that in your own homebrew worlds. And so The Voyages, this is my first two books in my, what I'm calling my expedition series. And it's um, a series based upon traveling and wandering and like experiencing everything that a world might or could have. Um, so naturally part of that is transportation, right? Um, so how are you going to get around these worlds? How are you going to travel, right? Or how are you going to go from point A to point B, putting it very simply. Um, and there's so many aspects when you involve uh, fantasy, but also mm -hmm. natural um, and that's one thing I got to say is like without any other type of thing is you need to, as a, a GM uh, or a player, you want to be in a world that is believable, but also fantastic. Right. Yes. And so if you don't have those aspects, then you just, number one, you either believe that you're in the real, the real world or you're in a world that's so, so incredible that it's hard to believe, uh, which is fine the way, but I just want a world that it matches the natural understanding of the real natural world mm -hmm. with the tropes of fantasy. Uh, because I feel like those two aspects are so important because mentally us as humans have to understand things as a natural sense, but also we want to be inspired on the fantastic sense. Yeah, def that's, def that's definitely the case. And when, when it comes to when it came to um, 
when it came to setting up this part this particular motif, what were you were did you end up doing a whole lot of research when it came to flora and fa flora and fauna, or was that or was that building on stuff that you were already doing in your own um, campaigns outside of this? So uh, to answer that question, it's both. Um, all this stuff that I am creating for, like, say, book stuff or book content or for people to use in their own world is literally for my own world as well. But I, I'm also building upon that, own, that my original concept or my original thought where, say, anyone can use this stuff and, and develop a more lore and background information in my own my own private world and uh, through like uh, uh, world anvil and things of that nature uh -huh. really developing more of like a, a wiki page per se yeah. uh, for my own content but uh, to, to answer a previous question i didn't really kind of get to him so i apologize i, I can kind of go on and on but um so the split between the two books really coincides that where i felt was natural so the book one, which is Magnificent Mounts and Where They Go, mm -hmm. is really a play on, like, say, uh, uh, like the Harry Potter theme of, like, um, uh, uh, the Fantastic Creatures uh, mm -hmm. uh, movies and stuff. And it's not so much that I wanted to play off of, like, their content, but, like, so much more that I just love it. I love Harry Potter and uh, th that type of content. And I wanted to build off that, like, name. And so, like, the first book really encompasses um, actual travel. Uh, so like mounts, uh, fantastic, uh, so teleportation, uh, broomsticks, um, using uh, homestones, um, uh, flying castles, um, that type of content, mm -hmm. right? And the second book encompasses the more natural feeling world. So it encompasses the terrains and the, basically the, the nomads or the bandits or these different uh, creatures you may uh, find within them. All right. And... Given the fact that a lot of this is dealing with um, travel, would you would you say that the act of traveling from 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 po from point to point is underutilized in a lot of in a lot of tables? Well, so like we've all played games, we've mm -hmm. all played uh, we've all played Skyrim, we've all played Morrowind, we've all played um, different uh, uh, Dragonstone, we've all played these different games that take travel in the sense that you can quickly transport from one location to another instantly, right? Mm -hmm. Without without like having to interact with the random vagabonds, the random personnel, the bandits, the nomads, these individuals that may be traveling down the road with you. Um, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But in my sense, I'm like, there's so much story that can be, number one, like you can plant seeds as a DM or GM um, into your world by, you know, just simply traveling from point A to point B. You can you can spread rumors. You can spread correspondence. You can spread thoughts with personalities and different individuals that have traveled the world further than the, your 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 player characters have. And that's so so very important in the sense that like, it's just it's it's it brings so much personality into your story which is very hard to sell in the sense that like until you're living it mm -hmm. until you're in the game and going, you know, after, after three days of going, okay, you travel and you spend the night, you travel and you spend the night, you travel and you spend the night at a certain point. Why would you, why would you story tell that as a, as a DM or GM? Why would you waste your time telling the same exact thing for seven nights in a row? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, you can develop tables, you can build tables, depending on your content, depending on all the stuff. But if you don't have the personalities in place to make it more realistic and make it more believable, then why would you even play it? Like, I wouldn't. I would just be like, okay, yeah, yeah, no problems. Um, roll me a, D, a percentile. And if there's like some relative combat that may pursue, I would develop, I would build off that one combat encounter. And after that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. I wouldn't carry it. I wouldn't worry about it because what's the point of wasting my time and my player's time at the table, which most of us, especially right now, find it hard to find. Which I, I can, um, I can, I can definitely see that. And while the, while of course there is the possibility of doing things like hex crawls or the, 
interesting system that um, the One Ring uses. I'd I'd say I'd say a bit. There's definitely that repetition thing, and and uh, and um, with that in mind, how how do you plan on how do you, how does your book plan on addressing that whole repetition issue? So again, um, I th I, th I take a very realistic aspect to the approach to world building. Um, I develop my world off of realistic concepts or realistic themes, and so like you would say, like your ecology or your terrains or your climates. I don't have this fantastic climate of like this maid zone or like this area of like where you can't exist because you don't, you know, have this level of, 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 of uh, experience or whatever it is. There's no part of my, my personal world that you can't exist in um, for a different reason. Now you, you do have like areas that have ties to uh, heavy ley line magic, um, and, and things that where magic is more powerful, sure. But that doesn't mean you can't experience it. It's just more, you're going to get a lot more of the wild magic aspects of, of fantasy that I think are not abnormal, that are not so uh, unreal that you can't believe them. But they bring that level of fantasy up past what you would consider, like, say, I like to try to do a 50-50 split between, like, the natural world and, like, a fantasy world. Mm -hmm. And this would, in these, these different ley line areas or these different heavy magic areas that you would say like it's like a, a 75 to 60 60 percent uh split to like the fantasy level and so like i'm giving you as a dm or gm um content that is number one easily put into your world without spending hours of trying to unlace or unwind this content it's dry it's to the point it's it's easily adaptable in the sense that you don't have to have this, you don't have to play in my world mm -hmm. to use it, which like, so like ice gnomes, right? Uh, number one gnomes, right? Ice gnomes. I used to put the words up like ice gnomes. Obviously that's in a more Arctic uh, territory, right? And you develop off of that. And it's, it's really easy to go, okay, I can see where these people would exist in my world. And I don't have to play in, in Hobie's world. I can play in, my own world that I've been playing for the last, you know, seven, eight years. And I can bring these people in without much effort or much strife. Yeah. And w when it comes now, I will, ad I will admit that when I was going over, um, voyage, when I was going over, um, voyages, one of the jokes I ended up making in my head was saying that we're dealing with a fantasy Oregon trail. <laughs> Which, admittedly, is a deep cut on my part, but when it com when it comes to tr when it comes to transportations, I could easily see an assumption that this is that it mainly concerns ground or more um, conventional ish kinds of transportations. But you did mention things like te things like teleporting and the like, and given. Given what you're trying to do with these books, what would be a few examples on how someone could use this to spice up um, teleporting systems? So, I mean, to play off that, like, it, I mean, I, I can't, I, I never heard that until you said it, the Oregon Trail thing. But I'm like, I laugh because, like, I grew up uh, playing the Oregon Trail, right? Um, you know, as a kid, like, one of the, the funnest things we could do and computer class was going to play, you know, uh, where on earth is, or where in the world is uh, Carmen San Diego, mm -hmm. Oregon Trail, and these different games, right? So, I mean, there's probably some of that heavy, that heavy level of 80s, 90s, baby, if me. But um, also, it's just, I mean, I mean, caravans, right? You, I, I'm sorry, like, not everyone can afford to teleport. Not every single uh, character that you you're going to encounter in your fantasy world as a player or as a GM is going to have the financial capability to be able to teleport instantly, you know, 700, 600, a thousand, whatever distance it is away. And naturally, it comes down to the realistic world, right? How did we do it back in the day? How did we make this happen? And it was through caravans, it was through wagons, it was through transportation. And I, I do do a really good job of like taking wagons to a fantasy level 
um, with things of like uh, the barred wagons mm -hmm. um, and like um, the the carrying of um, the artifact item uh, wagons, right? So these are the wagons that you would say that would carry this uh, great and, and, and powerful artifact of a deity, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's really easy to bring that into your world, right? Um, but on the, on, the, on the flip side, right, adventurers, uh, your player characters are not going to want to spend um, playing, which, which with, within the realm of like, you know, depending on the person and the character and things of that nature, um, they're not going to want to spend, you know, three sessions on a caravan, right? Yeah. And so when I developed the caravan system, it was giving the ability to create a caravan if the, if the GM wanted that. But also, like, there's nothing wrong with encountering this massive uh, caravan system and going, "What the fuck is this?" You know. And I apologize if I, if I shouldn't cuss, but no, 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 uh, no, you're good. Uh, okay, good. So I, I apologize. <laughs> I just have a natural mm -hmm. uh, fluency with a uh, uh, language naturally. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, so when I was going, okay, what kind of fantasy? Um, transportation should exist in my world. And one of the things that I've always loved um, was this idea of this, this one character, this one individual reoccurring and in constant from level one to level 20. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, and the, I developed that through uh, Tarv Long Ale, which, and, and through his traveling tavern. Um, which I absolutely love. And that's probably one of the most um, e most explained fantastic transportations in, in, in this book and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I really give it up to the DM to expand upon and, 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 and include that. Because I don't think the idea of like, say, broomsticks, um, uh, flying carpets, flying castles, um, you know, teleportation circles are not that not that understood mm -hmm. in whatever game type you might be playing. Yeah. But I wanted to give them something where I took one idea and just ran with it. And I can, I can definitely get that Pers personally. I've, um, I've allowed stuff like teleportation in, in some of my games, but I've had, I've had the caveat of unless you're teleporting to specific points, that that are that are laid that are laid out, you know, way um, specific waypoints, kind of like the whole crystals thing in a Final Fantasy game. It's a crapshoot. Yeah, one hundred percent is like with the the idea behind teleportation circles, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea is circle. It's a, a sigil. It's a mark. It's a something that's pre-programmed into the world that you can say transport from here to here, and there's nothing in between. You can really just magically do. But also, like, I love the idea of, like, say there was this um, fantasy family, this regal family that's been experienced in this this one realm for a long time. And they've um, – think of, like uh, – I'm sorry, I'm from Texas. So mm -hmm. um, this idea of, like, uh, one ranch in Texas owning a very large portion of Texas, which, speaking of Texas, is just massive, right? It's stupid yeah. how big Texas is. And so for you to own 1%, 2% of a state, it's, it's, it's a lot of land. And so like in, in me viewing them on a fantasy setting, I'm like, okay, so what if I was this family and I wanted to transport from this location to this location? So I, I didn't say, you know, teleportation circles. I went and developed this idea of, of like almost like a lodestone or like a relic or like the sense of, um, what you want to say, like I call them homestones. Mm -hmm. And it's this idea that you can transport anywhere in this specific area instantly if you are either a bloodline relative or you have the almost like a, a key or a password or something along those lines, right? And that's what I developed off of that. And, um, and, it, and it goes on and on. There's two different categories of, uh, of the uh, – Fantastic transportations that I cover mm -hmm. within, you know, um, you know, five thousand words or so. Yeah. Now, when it comes when it comes to some, when it comes to some of the things in mounts, um, would it be fair to say that most that most of the mounts are going to are going to be in 
the description of something that would that could feasibly be natural within a fantasy world, or there's some that are going to be a little bit more, for lack of a better word, esoteric. I want to say both. Um, so there's some that are going to exist that almost, and like one thing, uh, which I don't know how much you follow, like my content stuff. So mm-hmm. I created one of my books, which is the 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 brother book to my 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 plant book. Um, and this was in the same aspect that I wanted to create creatures that weren't monsters, that weren't out there for you just to, to, to murder hobo and 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 just kill. You know, this is meant to to uh, as a for a GM to build upon the ecology of their fantasy worlds and make their worlds more believable, right? Mm-hmm. And so with the mounts, it's still placed in that aspect of that original thought, that original plan, that original content. But more so in the idea of like, okay, so yeah, these things exist in nature. How do they interact? How do they develop? How do they, you know, what are their physical characteristics? But also, how do you turn a creature into a mount, right? So how do you go from a bull to, or a a stallion or a horse to a steed? You know, how do you turn that into a creature that can I can I can you know use in my fantasy worlds, or that like say you are a player character and you're adventuring in this world, and you come to a location that's in a swamp. You know, how are they getting around this swamp? You know, what I mean, one of my one of my favorite creatures is a, is the swamp Monrove. Um, it's 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 really a interesting character of like um, flora and like uh, fauna in, enveloped in the very swamp as- aspect. Mm-hmm. And they, it's almost like the magic of the of the natural world has you know encompassed this creature and developed them together in a symbiotic relationship, right? Yeah. And it's 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 just natural. It's not that I'm trying to reinvent the world or I'm not trying to reinvent your games. That I'm just taking realistic aspects and developing upon them, and it's such a high level detail that you don't have to do anything other than maybe make some stats mm-hmm. um, it, it, at best. And even and even with that, I'm get the from the preview that I've that I've seen. It's it seems that one of the things you're going into is that um that there's go, that there that when it comes to creating those stats, even though you're not putting out the sheet yourself, there's plenty of material to draw from. So so um somebody would have a good idea on a creature's habits, what they tend to eat, what they tend to avoid, if they're a, if they're a pack creature, if they're more of a solo thing, so on. Yeah, exactly. Give me just one second. I'll pull something up real quick. All right. All right. So I just pulled up one of the writings just real quick, um, just in my, my drive and stuff. Um, this is one of my actually, you know, I just pulled up the, literally alphabetical. Um, the Koski otter um, is one of the creatures that is uh, one of the mounts. And uh, I've, I've broken these mounts into subcategories based upon race. And none of these races that I want to say that are like so fantastic, they couldn't exist in your world. It's the typical like elf, dwarf, gnome, halfling uh, races. It's nothing that's going to be like, oh, this is a celestial being that's existed for you know 450 years, and it's just none of that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because I don't want to create content that you can't use. So specifically, I go into details about um, you know it's uh, the males are female. The males are between four foot nine and five foot six in height to their shoulders, and the females are 3.3 to 4.9 in their height. The length of males is between 3.2 and 4.2 feet. And the females are, you know, mm-hmm. and so on. Uh, I, t- I talk about the, the individual weights between the, the males and the females. Um, I talk about how the, the relationships, um, the creatures primarily hunt by sight when they are at, out and above water. It is able to recognize observers at greatest distances. The fact is they exclusively attacked active during the day further suggests the eyesight should be strong to aid in hunting and predator avoidance, right? And so, like, from to me, as a GM, right, and I'll, I'm going to provide basic stats um, for the fifth edition, you know, uh, rule set. 
And mostly because like, I feel like that's a, a very least a very good rule of thumb, right? Uh, or a general outline for you to go, okay, well, if they have a, you know, a seven intelligence in this world, they would probably have that seven intelligence in this game set, right? Um, because I feel like the base stats don't change drastically, at least in the majority of uh, games. Mm -hmm. But they also can. So, like, uh, I really have a different, I really developed a different rule set, which I'm hoping to include um, as a sidebar to each page to where, like, I break down the basic components. Um, like, so, like, the average height, the average weight, the average length, the average physique, um, the lifespan, population, uh, and things of this nature that, like, as a DM or GM, that you may want to go, oh, hey, these are things that, like, I could quickly use and and utilize almost instantly in my world and just give a, like, if even if it's just to make the, the, tra the travel world or the... Um, whatever world you're living in, just a little bit better. Um, and you, I mean, think about this, like a, an otter, right? We all mm -hmm. intellectually know what an otter is. We know that they, they live in water systems. They live in like, they love rivers and, and streams and, and flowing water. So this is really easy to go. Okay. Um, maybe some of my, my, uh, my halfling uh, situations may use these. Maybe my, my elf societies that are developed around river systems may use these or even human societies. Right. Now, I, I classify this as, a, as an elf mount, but that doesn't mean that a halfling society or a human society may not use these guys as well. Yeah, and I can I can um, def I can definitely get behind that sort that sort of thing. Um, now, when it comes now, when it com when it comes to so when it comes to um, some of the some of the other. Tr methods of methods of um transportation um the this brings me to the question of tech level because obviously not everybody's um tech level in fantasy is going to be created equal some might want to go with the more um standard route the tolkien melting pot at, at all while others may want to go with the with some with something a little bit more advanced like if if they are, say are running something like Eberron, which leans very much into steampunk slash magipunk, would there be would there be would there be modes of transportation that would accommodate that? So, um, so I, I developed this stuff very, very broadly upon my world, right? So it's mm -hmm. my my concepts or my things that I want in my own homebrew world, um, but also in the idea of like what someone might be able to use. Um, so some of my, my uh, dwarven mounts and uh, no, primarily my no mounts are what I would consider more um, steampunky, right? So like mm -hmm. I have um, one of the new, the new art pieces that I haven't unveiled yet um, involves like this, um, basically this large drone like creature. Um, if you want to consider like, say if you had like a mantis, like uh, mechanical marble um, that has a a dome like apparatus upon it, mm -hmm. and build upon that in like the sense that maybe gnomes could exist in this apparatus, right? Because I, I feel like I never found a place for my the gnomes of my world to exist. Um, not so much, but honestly, it's because I think gnomes and halflings and dwarves are just so gosh darn similar. If you think about them as as a three peat, right? Mm -hmm. And so, like, for me to develop my own world, my own gnomes in my world, I wanted to give them something incredible. And maybe this is because of World of Warcraft or, or whatever uh, game system, but I've always thought my gnomes as being, you know, mechanically inclined, but also in the realm of like ties to nature and ties to the mythos or, or magical nature of the world. Yeah. Um, and so, that's why this this mechanical marvel has aspects of mechanical, magical, and also nature, um, and also uh, on that aspect in the fantastic uh, transportation methods, um, I, I develop into uh, zeppelins, or um, even the uh, the flying buildings or the uh, mechanical marvels that flying buildings could be right. So as you is it maybe a, a massive you know level twenty uh, mm -hmm. mage or something like that, you might be able to come up with this concept of like how 
your 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 wizard tower is going to fly right and 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 do that purely arcane uh but there are some of those people that are like artificers or like these content creators that are like um less magically inclined and more mechanically inclined but also have a magical nature to them Mm -hmm. and so that's where that zeppelin idea comes in and also the flying builder comes in even honestly the animated object for that that aspect of things um, because there's nothing wrong with having an animated object that is partially mechanical and also partially magical. Um, mm-hmm. 100%, because I don't think there's one thing about a Zeppelin existing in the 1400s of our real world timeline without some types of uh, fantastic or magical uh, coronation, right? Or co- uh, a tie to. Yeah. Now, with the with that kind with that kind of thing in with that kind of thing in mind, um, now obviously, any sort of adventuring is going to have to have um, some some form of ta- some form of um, taverns, and it looks like that's cover- that's covered as well with the ta- taverns when it comes to what's in the place, what you might expect from it, um, what sort of food what sort of food one can order, which is something I don't see a whole lot of people covered just just as a whole or if they do they just um import over food from our world yeah so um sorry carry on so what i was what i was curious about is what would what would be a few examples you you can give as far as putting that kind of thing in and what was the reason for putting in um essentially fantasy food All right. So, um, number one, it's natural, right? Mm -hmm. Why would you not, if you had a, a vampire or you had a type of creature that existed in your world, why would you not utilize that creature to make said snacks, said, said foods said entrees Mm -hmm. said drinks, whatever it is. Um, and I, I I may take a little bit of a, a, a liberalness in the sense that like, some of this stuff is, is a little bit more fantastic in the idea that um, say like the uh, Tars Tavern is very much my high fantasy tavern. Um, that is, it's very mystical. It's very fantastic. And, and then not, not every tavern in my fantasy world is going to exist on this level. And that's one thing I, I want to say, like DM should never go. Every tavern needs to be this tavern. Mm-hmm. I'm like, no, because this tavern is unique and it's like my expression of what a fantastic um, uh, transportation could be. Um, it's like me going, okay, here's these fantastic transportations. And here's me going full nerd and full like writer and explaining to you how I took one idea and went just ludicrous with it and gone, here you go. Um, and like, that's where I, I gave like the general like concept or general idea and then give the secondary of like, here's the nuts part, right? Like, I mean, everybody loves banana split, right? You have yeah. your ice cream, you have your bananas, you have your syrup, you, you have your whipped cream, cherries, right? But what if you took a banana split and just made it like just even better, um, which is different types of ice cream and just simple, right? But you mm-hmm. expanded upon this idea, this concept. So one, one uh, simple idea is like I took um, the sugar cookie platter, right? Mm-hmm. It's a classic. A small plate of these sugary cook delights is enough to send your taste buds into, pleasure, uh, into a pleasure cruise. Just be careful. The sugar rush that will come with this is really effective, right? So like the side effect from this could be if you so chew, I mean, they could just be normal sugar cookies. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you wanted to add a side effect. You could say when that you eat these cookies, you gain a two d six temporary hit points. Additionally, you add two a plus two d dexterity score up to a max of twenty, and that you can take the dash action as a bonus action. After two hours, you lose this bonus and take a level of exhaustion. Right. So there's that mm-hmm. that risk and reward. Right. And DMs or GMs could use this if they chose choose. The side effects are not necessary, but it's about adding this menu items and these concepts of like, why is your food not fucking fantastic? Why are you breaking yourself down and serving fucking uh, barbecue short ribs you got down from the street, uh, you know, three days ago? Uh, nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'm trying to create content so you don't have to. Especially, especially since um, there, there can, 
given given the different cultures that you can have in a setting, I do think that there that there is a missed opportunity to ha to have different cultures or different races argue about who cooks better. I mean, af after all, I've you're you've prob you probably just as much as I have have had to set had had to sit on the sidelines during what during one of those who makes the better barbecue arguments. <laughs> oh, one hundred percent. Like, I mean, I think no matter what culture you're from. Mm -hmm. No matter if you're from the south, you're from the north, you're from a uh, a uh, a Muslim background, you're from a Jewish background, you're from whatever it is. There are types of dishes that you enjoy because it's it, it, it's home, right? It's mm -hmm. it speaks of home and life. So now you take this concept of like um, just a human culture, and now you divide it upon a dozen races. And you're saying, and you can't sit there and say that there's not going to be arguments or different cuisine ty cuisine types or any type of aspect that is more diverse because this clan versus this clan versus this clan say that I can't, I, I want this, you know, because this is what I grew up eating, right? Mm -hmm. We've we've all had um, cornbread, right? Um, my cornbread and your cornbread are probably super different, right? Um, and I, I'm not even going to get into that level of things, right? That's a that's an argument for itself. But we all have different aspects of, like, say, bread, mm -hmm. um, or like uh, the basic concept of bread. I I personally love rye bread, um, but I've probably never had rye bread in a form of like where it was originally created or what it was originally thought it should be. Um, and I would love to try it one day. And I hope I hope I do. But what I can get in where I'm at is the basic concept of what rye bread is. Right. Mm -hmm. And so one might be able to develop this general description of an item. And so I even bring into like where it can be from. Right. Um, so I bring like, a, it's very simple in the, the idea of, because I don't want to give you so much that you're forced to make it into a part of a, a area or a world, but I give you like where something might be found. Right. Mm -hmm. So like towns and jungles or, Plains and villages, or you know, this might be found in a half orc location or an orc lo location. Um, this is this is what I give you is like this aspect of like this is where this might come from, and this is where why your tavern may or may not have this um, aspect, right? Like the ink pop, right? It's this 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 basically play on like the the Starbucks cake pop, right? Um, it's but it's way more different. It's just more like a Japanese type of culture, right? Where it's got this idea of like a seafood cake pop in a sense. Mm -hmm. And what aspects in towns may serve this, right? So obviously, um, you're more seafaring, or you're more riverside, or uh, people that are pulling from the bounties of the water um, cultures would have versus anywhere else, and that makes it truly unique. Yeah, and I can de I can definitely uh, see see that now. One, I of course noted that when it came to caravans, you have a caravan generator, and we here in the temple love messing around with with random generation. Now we did we did that um, just a couple days ago with a different system. What sort of what sort of factors are in play when it comes to that um, system for generating caravans? So let me pull up the doc just real quick. All right. So um, I go into go into detail about like say caravans in general, mm -hmm. because I think that's that's um, I feel I believe that no matter whether you're I mean a car is a car right regardless if you're a, a German make or you're a American made or wherever you're from it's a, a it's got four wheels and it's got an engine and it's got the way it drives right the, the the core mechanics of it doesn't change so like I feel like every aspect of what I create um, needs to have that aspect of what makes it possible no matter what situation you're living in or where you're from or anything like that and why mm -hmm. it could happen right so the, the the caravan generator goes into the different types of wagons so um i took a very um american you know um oregon trail-esque to to play off what you said earlier uh look into it where i'm like i developed wagons like the armored the armored wagon the bordello wagon the chuck wagon 
uh, the forty wagon, the giant cargo wagon, which is more fantastic look on, like, say, just a normal wagon. Uh, but also, I think that because of the the world that you may exist in, may have beasts or beasts of burden that are gigantic, and they are able to pull loads that normally wouldn't be. So, like, if you could quintessentially say it's the uh, fantasy version of a of a semi mm-hmm. uh, in aspect, right? And like the herbalist wagon, um, the the typical horse draft. And gone go into like wagon enhancements and like so in your fantasy world, you may have the ability to make uh, extra dimensional spaces, right? Mm-hmm. And so uh, bags of holding, in essence, right? But why can't this wagon exist with even a larger bag of holding, right? In essence, it may cost more. It may be more expensive to create that type of wagon, but also it can hold a ton of cargo, right? Um, and so I develop that. I develop into contraband, the treasures, the defense durability, the navigation and travel of these uh, wagons. Um, and also what type of caravan workers you're going to have, right? So you're going to have entertainers, you're going to have escorts, you're going to have drivers, you're going to have um, guards, guides, healers uh, for hires, uh, heroes, casters, passengers, traders. Uh, the list could go on and on and on and on. Yeah, and I, it's like I said, it's it's something I can eat. I can easily see. Go, I can easily see going with. Um, and when it when it comes to when it comes to tales, was that was that a means of um, representing um, ru- rumors, hearsay, fairy tales, and up to up up all the way to the whole bardic knowledge thing? Um, and and so and so many things, yes, but. Um... The tales is, is more of an interesting aspect. I really feel like I'm the first one that came up with the concept. Maybe mm-hmm. not. I don't know. But um, I, I was really irritated. When, uh, so your players go to a library, yeah? Yeah. And they go to – got to think about a library. This is going to have – you know, it, it, even the most basic library is going to have you know 100 books or so, give or take. I mean, within the realm of like thinking of how – uh, books existed in a more uh, medieval setting or fantastic setting, right? So obviously books are way more precious than what we give them credit for today. Um, but these, all these, these tales that exist are able to flush out your world in the sense of like mystery, legends, myths, and things now you don't have to use them you don't have to use all of them i mean there's there's uh, 50 myths there's 50 legends and all these are giving you basically you know who wrote the legend who wrote the myth um and, and an excerpt of like what the book would actually say um so like so it was like a a quote from the book itself and and the basic details of the book itself and what it's going to contain and that's what i want to highlight is like while this excerpt might not uh Pose beneficial to your world th- that as the, the uh, general contents may go, Oh, okay. Okay. I can see this. And w- you as a, as a GM or DM may want to build upon that. And uh, also number one, build inspiration, build lore, and also make your world that much more fantastic. Um, how incredible it is to, for you as an adventuring party to stumble upon a, a small caravan and to sit around a, a fireside and be told a story uh, from this 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 vagabond type character, this hermit type character that's been traveling with this caravan for the last two months, and for them to tell you a story that you've never heard, you know what I mean, or give you the general details at very least, um, which I think is a general as a GM or DM that you should be able to build more realistic um, content based upon the, an outline, uh, if that's something you so choose to do, and that that's I, that's just such an incredible feature for me personally to go. Okay, I read a quick quote. I read a paragraph of content without bogging me down with just so much level of details that I can get the gist and I can add it to my world simply, quickly, and effectively. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the one of the other um, things that's part that's part of the Kickstarter is the decks. What what can you tell me about those? What can you tell me about those decks? So, I mean, honestly, um, the decks are, and this is maybe shooting myself in the foot, but the decks are just giving you another tool as a DM. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing about the decks um, that, will ex- that will not exist in the books. 
Um, this is just a feature. So I love, so let's take the menus, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if you, if you as a DM, the Marvelous Menu decks takes those and you will be able to pull four cards from the decks and build a menu for ter uh, for any of your, your uh, taverns that may exist in your world effectively and quickly. Um, and, and honestly, it develops two options because I'm doing a face and face. So it's, uh, it's one menu type on one of the others. So say the, uh, the entrees, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or meal, um, you would have one on one side and another one on the other side. And so like that, uh, that effectively gives you so much room that you can say, okay, the special is this, but also we have this, but it's more expensive. Um, or you can pull a handful of cards, you know what I mean? Depending on what you want to do as, as, as you're developing, um, the, 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 the deck books, the book decks, I want to say is where it's giving you the, uh, the content in a, mm -hmm. a more random fashion. So if a player is, is saying, well, I'm just going to go to the library or I'm going to do some research and I just pull a book. Well, now you can say, hey, draw a card from this deck. You know what I mean? And also, and the other one is um, the, the characters, right? Is the ability to, to make generate characters very quickly and effectively without having to do a ton of looking through the book. Mm -hmm. It's just a, it's a different tool set depending on the type of GM you are. Um, and I personally, I'm, I'm, I'm an art inspiration type of person. I want to see it. And so like my, all of my books are so heavy with art and so heavy with like details of like image inspiration because I can't stand some books that I read or some supplements that I read are just so dry into the bone. Like I get it. It's great. It's inspirational. It's, it's, I can build off of that. Sure. But I want to see images that, that jog my brain and want me to read your content. Which given how, given how certain, how certain books, um, drew me in because of their art whether it be on the cover or just the um, art just the artist as a whole i can certainly see that now you are now um at the time at the time of this recording let me let me make sure i get the page back up because um opera decided to derp on me so you are current you're currently at 57.1 thousand with 23 days to go and meaning that you're getting you're not too far away from getting twice the um initial goal that you had so when it comes so um once everything shakes out when it comes to the kick kickstarter and all the paperwork that happens after it finishes what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? So what, one thing I do is like some of my bigger projects that I have, I have, I, I launch smaller projects for various reasons, um, either for world building aspects or just to uh, fund the art and things of that nature. Um, like, but I, I generally only want to launch two large projects a year. And so where I've developed, oh, this is after you know working through um, the herbology book and working through the animal book, and it's it's relatively the process. After it's all even even like right now, like all of the voyages of the vagabond, it's it's written, it's content that's ready to be edited, right? And so, but aspects of that also say you have to almost uh, rewrite. I want to say not I want to say rewrite, but you have to go back and look at again and flush out, right? Because your editor says. Hey, um, this is what I'm thinking on this content. Um, so what's what? What do you think? And they're like, oh, you're like, yeah, you're right. Let me flush this out more. And so you'll you'll go back and you'll recreate, you'll rewrite, and you'll uh, build off off a core concept. And there's there's stretch goals as well, which we're already we're already impacting stretch goals as they hit. But it's this idea of like um, while the creation is done, you're never done creating. Mm -hmm. In the aspect of like, you're going to trust your editors to tell you when something needs to be more established or more determined or, or better. Um, because you don't, I, I personally never want to create content that makes the individual guessing or leaves more to be desired. Um, I mean, granted, I mean, I've had to scale back my books um, because like I overwrite and me and my writers, we overwrite. Mm -hmm. And that was like, we realized with voyages, we're like, oh gosh, you know, how is this? I mean, even with before the stretch goals, we're like, or final or even an aspect of the final content. We're like, oh gosh, this is 500 plus pages. And that's a guesstimate. And we're like, and it's always ended up being more pages. 
than our original guesstimate by you know 20, 30 pages. So we're going, we're looking at 550 pages or give or take. And that's before any stretch goals happen. And we're going, okay, no, this, this can't happen. And so our realistic aspect is that if everything goes well, all the world insanity does not, you know, occur and all of our editors and our content creators can stay on talent on task that we're going to be sending out the PDFs and the digital content by say May, uh, July uh, or May or May or June. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then shipping is just shipping. It's just, it's just, it's the nature of getting your, your books in and stuff like that. It's just, it can be incredible. It can be a disaster all in the same realm. And so we're hoping to get the books out, you know, starting out as early as May, if everything with the print test goes good. Um, that's one thing we've learned and developed is like the value of, of a, a proofreader and a play tester and also the pre-test print is instead of guys, you know, 20 or 30 people getting books and going, Oh, Whoa, what, what is this? And you're going, Oh no. Um, getting that, that official pre-test, that pre-test print and going, okay, everything looks fine. Everything's good. Let's change these final few aspects and, and send it on this way. Mm-hmm. And so that, that May, June timeline is, is what we're expecting. All right. And I'll definitely be looking forward to seeing how, seeing how it, de- seeing how it develops when it, when the time comes. Um, but with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. Um, and anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. I uh, thank you for having me, man. I really appreciate it. Let me bloviate about my just insane brain that likes to go off the deep, the deep end of of fantasy worlds and fantasy creation. It's uh, incredible to be reached out to and and say, hey, like, talk about your stuff, man. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I appreciate the opportunity. I really, it's incredible. My pleasure. And as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory. But it is encouraged. Always. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!